All right, thank you everybody and welcome. I'm Julia Wiesenberg. I'm the Executive Director of Buckeye Book Fair and I'll be facilitating our program tonight. Buckeye Book Fair is a nonprofit organization that promotes Ohio authors and Ohio literacy projects. Every November, we feature 100 Ohio authors in our annual book fair. Tonight, we have in store for us a timely and important discussion about the overdose crisis and how Ohio is at center stage in terms of losses and successes. The format for this evening is we will have about 30 minutes of a lecture from our author, Jack Schuler, and then 30 minutes for discussion and questions. Tonight, Jack will be talking about the topic of his book, This is Ohio, The Overdose Crisis and the Front Lines of a New America. Jack Schuler is an author, independent journalist, and essayist. He's the editor of Between Coasts and is associate professor of English at Denison University, where he teaches American literature, Black studies, and chairs the concentration in narrative journalism. Schuler holds a PhD in English and an MFA in poetry. He is the author of three books, including This is Ohio, which was published last year. During tonight's program, please feel free to use the chat feature to submit any questions, and we will save plenty of time for our discussion. We will be recording today's program so it can be viewed later, but we will protect your privacy if you turn on your video. You can also leave your video off or use the chat feature alone if you prefer. To use chat during the program, hit the escape key to exit the full screen mode and click on the chat icon to enter your question into the window that appears. We would like to thank our sponsor for tonight's program, Ohio Humanities, whose mission is to provide educational humanities programs to all Ohioans. This series of Ohio Book Talks presents author-led discussions of new books covering different periods in Ohio history. Now, I am pleased to turn things over to author Jack Schuler to talk to us about the overdose crisis and Ohio's role. Hi, <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me and thank you to the, the Buckeye Book Festival and to Julia. Um, and thank you so much to the people who spent time with me as I reported this story. This book is dedicated to the ones who keep showing up. A busy summer morning in a grassy corner lot in Newark, Ohio. Storms rolled through last week and the worst of the summer heat has been kept at bay. Today, low with scraps of clouds wandering through. A tent is set up in the shade of a sprawling mulberry tree. A scrawny hackberry and a silver maple linger just behind. Some folks call these trash trees, but they are resilient wonders, pushing up through hard scrabble urban dirt and concrete, willing themselves into existence. These trees give ample respite to the unsheltered who gather at this corner, where a group of mostly women have set up this tent every Saturday for about a year and a half now. The group members offer food and clothing and harm reduction kits containing sterile syringes and the drug naloxone used to reverse opioid overdoses. In 2019, over 70,000 people died of a drug overdose in the United States, a staggering and unnecessary loss. In Ohio, things have been particularly grim. It's why many people come to this corner. And as anyone who spends any time at the corner will tell you, the overdose crisis especially affects those caught in our criminal justice system and those failed by our healthcare system. Activists and organizers in places like Newark know that fear, stigma, and a lack of resources get in the way. They know that it will take a shift toward thinking of addiction and overdose as a social justice problem, a human rights crisis affecting mostly poor people. They know that this can feel like an intractable problem. This book tells the story of a grassroots movement. This is a story 
of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. This is resilience. This is persistence. This is Ohio. Um, I am going to be showing some images tonight as I talk, um, scrolling through some images that I took while reporting of some of the people and the places that I'm going to discuss. And this right here is the courthouse in, in Newark. I wrote this book in part because I was frustrated by the coverage of Ohio's response to the overdose crisis, because it always felt like it was focused on high level responses on opioids, on the lawsuits, and on how crippled some communities seem. I remember especially how the national media picked up the story of the counties using uh, refrigerator trucks to store bodies that had, you know, from, from overdoses, I think Akron in particular. I was seeing people fighting back um, and this is their story. This is the story of those people who are fighting, fighting back. This is Ohio explores the overdose crisis as it plays out in Newark, Ohio, small city, less than an hour east of Columbus. Newark was once home to people who crafted amazing earthworks or mounds. And as Europeans settled, they built and built and it became a crossroads for canals and railroads and industry. Um, immigrants came from Germany and Eastern Europe to make things. The story of Newark is the same as in many places. As the world became more connected, local companies were gobbled up by bigger ones. Having agriculture and being close to Columbus has always given Newark a base, as has always helped it support this place. But now farmland is also disappearing at a rapid clip in Lincoln County as Columbus moves in this direction. In 10 years, Newark could be a part of a central Ohio megalopolis, but I suspect it will retain its scrappy no-nonsense identity, rooted firmly in its manufacturing past. Blocks from the county courthouse is the works, an interactive museum focused primarily on the history of industry in Lincoln County. On the second floor, in addition to the giant bones of a mastodon, you'll find cases full of things that people in this community once made, stoves, glass bowls, and plates, and so on. The display is at once a peon and a dirge, there's a photo in one case of the employees of Rural Stove Company from around 1892. Maybe 80 men standing in front of a, a brick building, two large windows. Some are propped up on the sills. They are dressed in filthy work clothes, light cotton shirts and pants covered in sweat and dirt. Some wear no shirts at all, only suspenders. Lots of mustaches, folded arms, serious faces. One man looks off to his right, the man next to him with massive biceps looks directly into the camera. Here and there, if you look closely, you can see a few children. And down in the front row, just off center, a man with his head cocked to the left, a slight grin. This is not a past that I want to romanticize. Their work was hard, hot, and dangerous. These men made things. They built stoves that people cooked on and fed their families with. And during World War II, World completely switched over to making artillery shells. There were not, these were not objects that you conjured into being, but objects that you crafted into existence. That world, of course, has changed a little bit. And as small Midwestern cities go, Newark is pretty typical. It's a place in transition. Um, once it was an industrial hub, a place with union jobs that could foster a family. In some ways, it's more prosperous than many places. Lincoln County has Amazon and other distribution centers but about 56% of the community of Newark is just getting by, according to the United Way's Alice report. And it's no surprise that the overdose crisis, the thousands of Americans who have been dying from unintentional overdoses last year, over 82,000, we think, seems to have especially affected places that have deindustrialized and, and people on the margins, the kind of people that you just saw in, in the trailer. My book focuses on organizing in these places in particular grassroots organizing in Newark and Licking County, activists and organizers from across the community who are trying to adjust the fact that so many are dying. I'll focus this talk on the two of them. But in some ways, to understand what's happening in Newark, you have to go to a place like Huntington, West Virginia, or to Portsmouth, Ohio, 
places that have lost even more and where in many ways opioids got their foothold in the region when big pharma came through and later when pill mills emerged and made it easy for people to access opioids. And this is a shot of um, from downtown uh, Portsmouth. The model for a pill mill is straightforward. All you need is a prescriber, typically the only person with any kind of medical background in a given clinic, an office, some prescription pads, a few pins, and a cash box. People who use pres prescription opioids like Purdue Pharma's effective time-release painkiller, OxyContin, the brand name of the generic drug, OxyCodone, can sometimes visit multiple clinics in a day. There's plenty of cash to be made. It's a story that's been told by intrepid reporters like Beth Macy, who focused on Southwest Virginia in her book, Dope Sick, and by Sam Quinones, who focused in part on Portsmouth, Ohio, and Dreamland. To understand the rest of Ohio, it helps to understand what happened in Portsmouth. At one point, Scioto County and its roughly 75,000 inhabitants had half a dozen clinics. Most were based in Portsmouth, but some were in nearby Wheelersburg and across the Ohio River in South Shore, Kentucky. In 2010 alone, at least 9.7 million doses of opiates were dispensed in Portsmouth, Scioto County. 123 doses each for every person in the community, child and adult alike, more than any other county in Ohio. Um, but they didn't uh, give up in Portsmouth and they fought to uh, shut the pill mills down. But what came next was sort of unintended consequences and a rise in IV drug use um, for people who couldn't access pills anymore. And with that came any even more overdoses, um, a rise in hep C. Um, today, the drug supply across Ohio and the US is full of fentanyl, which is um, much more lethal than oxy or heroin. Because of this, the stakes are high. Um, and there are many folks pushing grassroots efforts to save people's lives by distributing naloxone. For example, People like Trish Perry, who is mentioned in the trailer. There's Trish. Women like Trish Perry are part of a new wave. Call them activists, organizers, citizens. Call them warriors. They're on the ground, on the phone, on social media. They're fighting this overdose crisis. They counsel people who use drugs, helping them get into treatment, and they advocate for them. They sit in hospital ERs with people waiting withdrawal management. They distribute naloxone to anyone who'll take it. They are, and this is important, mostly mothers. I've met many fathers who care for and advocate for their sons and daughters with substance use disorder, but mothers seem to make up the majority of those people on the front lines, the ones starting organizations, lobbying legislators, counseling others. In Licking County, Trish especially has gained a reputation for better or worse as a mother not to be messed with, a mother who will go to the mat for her child. Sometimes she can piss people off online and in person. She's honest to a fault, fueled by righteous anger at some times and sweet non-judgmental love at others. She tells me of a time in the local ER when her son Billy, um, uh, his veins were so blown out that the nurse was flummoxed. And I remember feeling ashamed, she says, and she starts crying. Trish has learned, though, not to be ashamed. On the top of her right arm is a semicolon tattoo, a Christmas gift from Billy with blessed never give up over a background of pastels, green, red, and purple, with seagulls flying above. The semicolon is there to separate one story from the next story yet to be written, one tragedy from one triumph, one collapse from one recovery. She shows it off with pride because getting people's attention about addiction and overdose is her life's work. In addition to working 40 hours a week at a pet store, she's taking classes to earn her bachelor degree, helping to raise her grandson and caring for her father who has cancer. She wakes up every morning at four o'clock to, to check her email, to schedule posts for a Facebook support group she runs, to write cards to prisoners and folks in treatment, and to read up on addiction and pending legislation. In the past year, she's hosted three naloxone trainings, spoke to two Ohio House committees, and organized an overdose awareness rally in Newark. Every day, she says, she's in the fight. I learned a lot from Trish, um, primarily that um, stigma is real, um, and that the only way to help those with substance use 
disorder sometimes is just to love them. And that is an, an enormous challenge for many people. Um, she introduced me to her son, Billy, who in the book struggles with substance use disorder and then enters recovery. And his immediate response is to begin advocating for people who use drugs. His main mission is to help Licking County start a syringe exchange, a place to get new syringes. Along with his mother and some others, he begins working with an organization called Harm Reduction Ohio and starts showing up at meetings and city council. He's articulate and smart and knows of what he speaks. He wants to help people reframe addiction and overdose as a health issue, which they are, and transform the war on drugs narrative. Billy promotes, along with Trish and many others in this book, the concept of harm reduction which means reducing the harms of substance use and promoting positive change. Like for example, using a new syringe as opposed to an old one to prevent transmission of bloodborne pathogens. Harm reduction is both a public health and a social justice approach to substance use and substance use disorder. It says, meet people where they're at, but don't leave them there and reduce the harms of drug use and drug policies. So we should do all the things that keep people who use drugs safe and alive from distributing naloxone to opening uh, safe consumption sites to advocating for an end to the war on drugs. In many ways, it's true that we're addressing this particular drug crisis in ways that are different from how crack was addressed in the 80s and 90s, but the drug war persists. Um, I drove with Billy down to Waverly, Ohio um, in, 2018, where he was dealing with an abuse of harmful intoxicants charge. Um, and it was stemming from an overdose that he'd had while in treatment a couple of years before. Um, it was an auspicious day. It was the day before the 2018 election when in Ohio, people were voting on issue one. Um, issue one would, would have uh, reduced penalties for certain drug related crimes. And for Billy, it was a day he wasn't working. <laughs> It was a day he wasn't working, a day he wasn't able to work to support himself and his dreams. That day, I learned uh, something. I learned that the drug war is not SWAT teams and drug busts. Um, it's mostly mundane things like, like this experience. At 8.30 a.m., folks file through metal detectors and into a courthouse lobby, where there are rows of folding chairs for those waiting to hear their names called. At first, there are no seats. The demographics of the room lean white and working class with people who seem to be on their way to work. Lots of Carhartt clothing, muddy boots and sneakers with paint stains, just like Billy's. Lots of people who look like they've been living hard. As if on cue, Billy scans the room and remarks, lots of people in here are dealing with the same things. For an hour, we sit waiting, staring at our phones, staring ahead, staring out the windows. A man in a red polo walks out into the lobby, takes down the clock on the wall and sets it an hour back. It's the Monday after daylight savings time ended. He reaches up, puts the clock back in place and retreats. The only thing that signals we're in a courthouse is the stack of docket books and a woman behind the counter who answer, answers the phone by saying, Pike County Courthouse. This place looks like an old Walmart, I say to Billy. A woman chatting with a man wearing a cowboy hat pipes in, Used to be a Kmart. I stand corrected, I say, and we all laugh. But they still have the blue light special, Billy jokes. As of 2017, the latest year for which official numbers are available, there were roughly 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States, almost half a million of them for drug offenses. That number does not include those who committed crimes to support drug use or other drug related crimes. Police, Prosecutors and judges spend a lot of time and resources punishing people for drug possession. These kinds of arrests disrupt low income communities and communities of color, especially, making lives more complicated, causing people to miss work, causing families to lose mothers, fathers, and siblings. Felony convictions create even more complications. Surprisingly, or maybe not, issue one has little support from law enforcement. Lincoln County Sheriff Randy Thorpe told the Newark Advocate that the measure was decriminalized plain and simple. He argued, quote, law enforcement requires the weight of proportional criminal consequences, not just to curb abuse and trafficking, but also to rebuild and save lives, end quote. In other words, sometimes it takes a stick to help someone get sober. 
At 11 a.m., Billy becomes justifiably frustrated. He still hasn't been called to appear. He walks up to the desk to ask if the public defender is around. The man with the red polo shirt says he'll check. Billy sits back down and tells me about a guy he met while in treatment here in Waverly. He looks him up on Facebook and discovers that he's since overdosed and died. The waiting room thins out. Some people give up. I gotta get to work, the man in the cowboy hat says as he limps out. It's 11.30 a.m. How do you plan a life around this stuff? Billy asks out loud. He goes outside to smoke a cigarette and make a contingency plan with his coworker. An hour later, Billy is rescheduled. He never entered a courtroom. He never saw a judge. On a drive back from Pike County, Billy and I talk about the future. And he says that at this point in life, he just wants to run his painting business and be proud of it. He says there was a time when he strived for other things, but now he wants to appreciate where he is and what he's doing. The next day, issue one is defeated by a wide margin. Advocates are surprised. Folks involved in the justice system are relieved. They can, for the time being, keep their stick. Um, and I, you know, I, I felt in many ways like that the chapter about taking Billy down to Waverly is one of my favorite, just because it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know, we go and we spend a day in this place, and I get to watch his life um, be put on pause for a day, and, and the consequences of that for him. Billy uh, and Trish and a coalition of activists begin uh, fighting for a syringe exchange in Licking County. And at that point, um, in order to have a syringe exchange in the state of Ohio, the Board of Health in each uh, county had to vote in favor of it. And um, the Board of Health in Licking County uh, does not approve it, votes it down. And so Billy and Trish and a group of activists um, organize a protest at the health department. Reporter from Spectrum News asks Billy if he'll go on camera. Billy tells him how he'd attended Board of Health meetings for months, asking for support of a, an SSP, which is a syringe services program. He tells him how the board voted in executive session without public discussion and without listing it on their agenda, how they have yet to explain their decision and how he is here today to seek answers and hopefully change some minds. If they paid attention to the research and science, all the counties that have done this, Billy says, it's a no-brainer. It's easier for them to say no comment than to say, we've made a decision based on scientific fact and we're going, we've decided to go against it. Billy is clearly fired up and the reporter asks him why. I'm a 10 year IV drug user, Billy answers. Been in recovery for over a year now. During the 10 years of using, I contracted hepatitis C I've had abscesses that almost took my life. I've been hospitalized for endocarditis. A small thing like a 12 cent syringe could have prevented all of that. What we've been doing for so long with the war on drugs is not working. In fact, it's cultivating addiction. We have gotta start looking at other pieces to the puzzle. There's no one fix to the opioid crisis in America. He's on message, on point, and he seems more comfortable with this camera in his face than he did standing in front of city council. Then the reporter asks him, what advice he would give to people who like him are no longer using drugs and trying to be abstinent. As cliche as it sounds, he says, take it one day at a time. Once we stop using drugs doesn't mean our life turns into rainbows and unicorns. Life is difficult at best, but taking life one day at a time, one obstacle at a time, what I've been able to accomplish in this last year has blown me away. And there's Billy speaking um, to the board. I think it's important to understand that a uh, syringe services uh, program or an SEP or syringe exchange, whatever you want to call it, um, it's a point of contact for an often stigmatized group of people. It's a place where they can feel connected and safe um, and it's research-based intervention that has been successful uh, for many years now. Um, and now more than ever, uh, especially right now during the pandemic, SSPs are important for dispensing naloxone and for connecting with people who don't often connect with others. I traveled, uh, when I was doing my reporting, I traveled to Vancouver and I saw what serious harm reduction looks like there in Canada. Um, I visited safe consumption spaces, 
opioid maintenance programs. Um, I learned about safe supply advocacy. It's a different conversation in Canada than it is in Ohio. Um, and I talk about this in the book, but on many occasions I would introduce myself to people and I would tell them I was from Ohio and they would hug me. <laughs> um, back when hugs, I guess, were safe. Um, and they would, you know, they would say, wow, I know, I know how hard it is in Ohio. I know how many people are dying. Um, and, but the thing that, that really impressed me about what they're doing in Canada is that, and I don't think we're doing this in the United States that we're beginning to, is that um, they really try to listen to people who use drugs and people with substance use disorder. These folks have seats at the table. Um, they even organize. Um, and that's starting to happen in the United States to a certain degree. Um, but it's not happening enough. And the emphasis on abstinence, um, you know, and that, that precludes people from speaking and the drug war makes it dangerous for people to speak um, and to, to be connected in many ways. What I realized though in Vancouver, what that, that despite all of that, despite all the issues that we're having in the United States, there's hope and the hope is in the nascent grassroots organizers that I, that I reported on in Ohio um, and beyond who are fighting for real change, not just around the overdose crisis, but I think how we engage um, with democracy. I asked a friend of mine to uh, summarize my book in a uh, meme, and this is what he came up with. Um, and I think part of what he was saying here is that we need to think about who gets included in the social contract, the, so, the so-called social contract. Um, and that we need to, and we need to, to widen it, right? We need to think about who gets to have a seat at the table. Grassroots organizers and people who use drugs are often the frontline innovators in ways that systems are not, um, and they should be leading community conversations. I think this book, I think my book is a story of hope, ultimately. Um, that's what I wanted to depict. And I think there's a lot of realism here, but there's also, just the idea that democratic institutions only work when they are pushed and pushed, and then they begin to make the world more democratic, more safe uh, and, and safer for more people. Um, the people in this book are relentless, they are scrappy, they are Ohio. Um, and I think especially now, especially now when things feel so hopeless, um, I think they're the ones having the last word. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jack. That was really wonderful. Um, Sorry about that hiccup. <laughs> that's all right. Technology always has a challenge for us, but mm. that was a wonderful um, intro, which is um, the first chapter of your book or the first um, couple the paragraphs program. of your book. Yep. And um, I wanted to open the floor now for everyone with questions. I did have a couple that we have received from the the internet. So I have some questions to get us started, but I did want to let our audience know that um, we'll now take questions and answers and have a discussion for the remainder of the session. And you can feel free to use the chat window to type your question in for us, or you can unmute or um, even turn on your video and talk to us. So we'd love to hear your questions. The question we received from the internet, and um, you know, I think you touched on this, and it kind of goes to the root of the problem, which is why are people still um, using drugs despite knowing how harmful they are? Um, I mean, I think people people use drugs for a simple reason because they make them feel better, right? I mean, that's one reason why people use drugs. Um, I think they also help people cope. Um, uh, I, you know, I think that um, after homeschooling my children uh, during a pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, and also trying to work at the same time, um, a, a glass of bourbon at the end of the day makes me feel better, right? Um, I think there's a difference between using drugs um, and addiction, right? I mean, addiction is when you, when you continue to do something despite the harmful consequences. And that's a, in some ways, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but I do think, um, I think that humans have used drugs, you know, for forever, right? Um, for all kinds of reasons and drugs help people. Um, you know, medication helps many people deal with depression, helps people deal with anxiety. 
Um, and I don't think those are, are, are bad things. I think we've gotten to a place where we, we separate out drugs and, um, and I think there, you know, we need to do some recalibrating, I think. Um, yeah. I agree. I think it's a very complex issue as to um, how people end up in the circumstances of addiction. And your story really takes from there, exploring the options for them. And your book, some of the dates within your book are, are a lot of the dates around 2018, and it just came out in 2020. Uh, what has been the response to your book um, just having come out last fall? Um, you know, I think that a lot of folks uh, who are reading it, um, I think for a lot of for a lot of people, it's um, new territory, right? Um, and then I think there are people who are reading it who already understand harm reduction and are interested in the story because we don't necessarily have many books that tell this kind of story yet. Um, and uh, but I think, you know. I, I gotta be honest with you, when I, when I was writing this, um, I, I feel like it was a learning experience, right? I, I don't write books, I write books about things that, um, that I don't really, that I don't feel I know enough about, right? Which is not the way some people do it. Um, I, I wanna take readers on a journey with me into knowledge, right? And so what I kind of was wondering was why are, why are all these people dying and, and why, um, why are we not doing anything about it? Um, we're still not doing anything about it, really. Um, uh, and um, and so I kind of began exploring that. And, and the book actually travels from what for me was a safe space um, of like, you know, the AA 12-step uh, model, which I kind of understood intuitively, um, to beginning to think about it as um, a health crisis, and then beginning to think of it as a political issue. Um, and that led me to harm reduction, to the people who are organizing around harm reduction, which isn't, you know, it's not a new concept. It's been around for a long time. Um, syringe exchange has existed since the, you know, 80s, um, the first exchanges. And I write about this in the book um, in New York City were, um, you know, centered around the HIV AIDS crisis, right? Because people realized that um, many people were dying because they had been sharing needles. Um, and, uh, and so those, and that's a really good example of what I was talking about, how, you know, if we would listen to the people who are suffering with the issue and like ask them what they need, they probably know what they need. And, and that was an example of that. They, they figured it out themselves and actually made this thing happen. So, but I didn't really understand all that stuff. I mean, I had a sense of what harm reduction was. Um, and, uh, and I've, like a lot of people have dealt with um, substance abuse, or substance use disorder in my own, um, in my own, my own life, my own family, um, but I didn't understand uh, the larger picture here. So um, I think I start the book in a place um, that is comfortable for some readers, and then I move into a place that is a bit more complicated. Um, and that's intentional because I'm also learning too, you know. Uh, when I went to Vancouver, I had never been to um, a safe uh, injection site, and I got to visit Insight, which was the first safe injection site in North America or a safe consumption site. Um, and it was kind of surprising and kind of amazing. Um, I saw people helping each other out, and I saw nobody dying. I didn't see anyone die in those spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah, you really cover so much of this. Uh, crisis in your book from the criminal justice side, from the grassroots side, and some of these more modern um, harm reduction efforts, which can get much more close into the realms of politics. And so have you heard much from politicians or from uh, community organizers in the wake of this book? Um, well, I do know that, I do know that um, Trish, the, the woman in the book, I know that she gave copies of the book to the members of the Board of Health. Um, and there was some discussion about whether or not they could take them. Is it a gift? Is it not? Da, da, da. And eventually the lawyer decided that it was okay. So I haven't heard from them yet, but maybe I'll hear from them. Um, but I just wrote about what I saw, right? Um, and I was just documenting what was happening around me. Um, and I, 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 I have shared it with some um, politicians. I've spoken to a few uh, 
people who are contemplating running for office or in office about it. Um, I, my, my message is that I just, you know, fundamentally, I think that things that we have tried have not necessarily, they haven't worked, clearly haven't worked. Um, and we need, to, we need to get creative. Um, and uh, until people are willing to maybe step out on a limb a bit, um, we're going to continue having the same result. Yes, I think so. And I think your book really um, can dem demonstrates that really well, that this is much needed in terms of making progress in this, in this crisis. And um, I'm just going to reopen up the floor for any questions. Sure. I just wanted to say something. I, you know, there's a, there's an app and I was just going to look at it real quick. There's an app that, um, uh, a group of students actually at Ohio State put together is called SOAR and it, and it sends you um, a message if there's been a, an overdose surge. And um, I got one on Sunday, there have been six deaths in Franklin County in 24 hours. And then I got a, one again on Monday, there have been five more overdose deaths. Um, and so, I, I mean, not to, you know, not to be an alarmist, but you know, look, this is what's happening. Um, when COVID, when we, when everyone, you know, is, um, has their jab and uh, the world maybe returns to some semblance of normal, this is probably going to still be around. Um, you know, that's an interesting point that isn't really in the scope of your book, but is fascinating in discussion is, um, will we see, are we not seeing the depth of the problem right now? Because we are socially distancing, or do you think that doesn't affect this as much? Do you think we'll, we'll see a bigger crisis reveal itself after we uh, shut down? That's, a, that's uh, a question that a lot of people are trying to figure out right now. Um, we saw a spike in overdoses um, in January uh, of 2020. So, and actually starting in December and leading into January, May was one of the deadliest months in the state of Ohio ever. Uh, I don't know what the final count was, but it was over 550 people who died in a month. Um, overdoses are up in part because of the, you know, the, the drug supply. There's a lot of fentanyl in the drug supply. Um, benzos are showing up, which can be dangerous with opioids. And um, you know, that's probably has to do with anxiety. There is an increase of isolation, right? We know that people are using a loan, which is very dangerous um, and economic inequality is growing, all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, if, the, if the problem is simply that um, there's this tainted drug supply, then, you know, we could see it go up and down based on the drug supply. If it's all these other things, which I tend to think that it is, um, it might be around for a bit. Right, this is an extra tremendous amount of social stress on people who are already suffering from, from too much social, social stress. Yeah, for sure. I see, Betty, you um, have your mic on. Do you have a question for us? Well, I just had a comment. Um, my son-in-law is in Tacoma, Washington, and he is working for the Tacoma Needle Exchange Department which was a, an first offshoot, one. Yes, an offshoot of what is it, Bruce? Uh, I'm, I mentioned his name in the book, but yes, he's the first, the first uh, needle exchange in the United States, um, set up on a corner with a TV tray, and uh, and you know he handed out um, clean uh, syringes to people. And so this organization now has is enormous. They buy all this kind of uh, equipment that they then send out to many, many, many health departments or agencies across the country, yeah. and as well as serving their, their own people. And uh, the kits have fentanyl, you know, strips in them to test for fentanyl. They have the, the naloxicone, they have syringes, whatever people need. And it just seems like it's a huge service to, it's, with the harm reduction idea. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are organizations, um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of that organization, but, I, um, but there are organizations around the country who are supporting people, especially people in rural places who don't have access to, um, uh, or regular access to uh, syringe exchange. 
Um, and there are organizations that are, you know, trying to get them the care that they need. Um, and, and even to people like Trish, who is sort of on an island um, in, in Licking County for some re reason still, um, you know, that are, are doing that work. And many of those uh, organizations are based in places like New York, and Seattle, Tacoma, mm -hmm. um, you know, places where, and, 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 and actually in San Francisco, places where syringe exchange started in the United States you know, in conjunction with the HIV AIDS crisis. Are there places around Licking and Wayne County where there are needle exchanges or is that? Uh, in, Wayne County, in Wayne County, I don't know for sure. I know of uh, an excellent exchange in, in Canton um, uh, that has been around for a long time, Akron as well. Um, okay. In Licking County, we do not currently have a um, health department um, approved uh, syringe exchange, which is kind of crazy. Right. They have one in Zanesville, but they don't have one in Lincoln County. I was present at a, pre uh, uh, well, virtually present at a presentation about homelessness in, Way in oh, Worcester, in Wayne County, and they mentioned that they looked to Newark for ideas for homeless programs. So I, I wondered if they, something's going right in Newark in that regard. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in Newark, uh, and, and this had a lot to do with, um, well, this had a lot to do with, with, with Trish and the folks who were gathering at the corner and their activism. Um, we, we didn't have a, um, uh, a, sh a cold weather shelter. It was a big issue and I write about it in the book. Um, and uh, you know, folks got together and, and made that happen. But I, I would say, and I, I, I make it, I think I make it clear in the book that the people sort of engineering that and really making it happen are grassroots folks who aren't getting paid for any of the work that they're doing. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a frustration by some people, especially grassroots activists, like traditionally, um, with the slow pace of change, you know, they want things to happen, you know, immediately. But, you know, right after the pandemic started, um, they, uh, a lot of these activists who congregate at the corner, um, at, at Trisha's um, Newark Homeless Outreach, um, they, they noticed immediately that people who were unhoused did not have anywhere to wash their hands, right? All the shelters closed, all the day, um, uh, programs shut down. So they didn't have anywhere to wash their hands or take baths. And, um, and they, they managed to figure out how to make that happen themselves. It's one of the things that I really um, appreciated in the book was there were, uh, there were groups of people um, organizing in Licking County from many sides of the political spectrum. And around this issue, they came together and they worked, um, you know, to help people. Um, and they did that right after the um, after the pandemic started. And it took a while for you know for the city or for the, the traditional organizations to to catch up with them. Um, and you know, part of that has to do with the fact that grassroots folks can be nimble. Um, but I do think um, I think that there is. Uh, you know, there's a fair amount of um, always in these situations. I think Vancouver is an, an, another example of that too, where people in power don't want to cede power to these organizers, to these grassroots organizers, even though they're in the thick of it and they actually do have good ideas and they bring them to the table. So I do, I think it's important to listen to, um, to folks like Trish. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can you comment on how Billy is doing? Uh, I, not exactly, because I would be giving away. Um, I, oh, right, I'm, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, thanks, Betty. That was um, great input. I appreciate that, and the um, work your son's doing uh, on this as well. Um, does anybody else have a question or comment they wanted to make? I know this is really um, the world we live in here in Ohio right now. Um, you know, we are all seeing it in our communities and we're 
you know, many of us volunteering. Um, and I know, I mean, what I really enjoyed about this book, um, Jack, you know, you're a journalism professor. So one of the ways I was looking at this book is, is how it was written and the great number of personal stories you weave in with all the facts. And um, I just, how did you know that this was the story that you wanted to write? And, and was it the people that really led you to this? Yes, it was all about the people. In fact, there was a version of this book that really cut out a lot. I mean, I, I just focus now on Trish and Billy, but there's a whole constellation of people in this book. And um, my editor really wanted me to tell, to let the chorus sing, he said, like, I want all of those people and let's figure out how to make it work with all of them, um, which is often not, you know, something you know, it's, it's not always a good idea um, in, in narrative uh, journalism to do that. Um, but I, you know, I did, I, there were a lot of people that I did that I didn't want to leave out and a lot of stories I didn't want to leave out. And, and I managed to meet people through, the, through other people. And that was just a way to segue from one story to the next. Um, and I figured out ways to sort of drop crumbs along the way um, for readers to um, you know, uh, clues for the, you know, for, for folks who enter the story a little bit later. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted to, um, I knew that I wanted to tell a story about, um, about the organizing. Like that was sort of key to me the whole time. Um, I wanted to tell a story that was hopeful um, because I do uh, feel like there's a lot of hope in the story. Um, I've written books about organizing before, um, so I, you know, it's something that I, um, I don't know that I, that it's a story that I like to tell, um, and, and I think the more that we need to tell more of these kinds of stories of people, um, you know, working together to make something happen. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I, I did not, um, you know, the the fight over the syringe exchange, I didn't imagine that was gonna happen. I didn't know that there was gonna be a, you know, a polar vortex and that, you know, and like it would lead to a crisis around um, the unhoused in Licking County. Um, I didn't, those things just happened, right? And I tell my students this all the time um, that, you know, when, you, when you're a narrative journalist, your job is to sort of create a story out of seemingly nothing, you know? Um, and there, you know, if on the surface, there's not, a, there's really not a story here. But I, I managed to find the people and to, and to write it in such a way that it becomes a story. Um, I also would would say too that like I, um, you know, in terms of the, the book as a work of nonfiction and the work a work of journalism, um, I think that. Journalist, I think when you're doing nonfiction, especially like this, you have the right to sort of create the ethical framework that you're going to work through, right? Um, I was really close with the people that I wrote about. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. I spent a lot of time going to meetings. I spent a lot of time at the corner, um, and and I and I cared about them, and I do care about them still. I'm still in touch with with pretty much all of them, um, all of them, uh, I think, uh, and I. Of course, this year has made it really hard. Actually, that's that's been one of the problems of the pandemic. But I, I, I I'm honest. You know, I'm on their side. I want I want them to succeed. Um, you know, because I I'm I'm their story or what they're doing feels compelling to me. But the story is as well researched as a story can get. Um, I think I told you earlier that I had a, a fact checker and a research librarian working close with me the whole time. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that's important. But I think you can, I think you can tell the truth, and I think you can also, um, you know, be biased. You know, I think that's okay. I think that's what narrative journalism does, and that's different from from what we expect of daily journalism. Um, and that makes it a bit more exciting. Um, and uh, but the story is true, um, and it it is uh, rigorously fact checked. And I told you earlier that I, there was a point where I had written, in, in one draft, I'd written about um, a gentleman, Chris Gargas, who talks about how he was a paratrooper and he used to jump out of a certain plane 
And I wrote that I had, you know, that he had jumped out of this certain plane and my fact checker said, no, 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 no one jumps out of that plane. You mean this plane, you know? So like, um, I knew from the very beginning that I was in trouble. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and <laughs> there was, um, how, do you, how do you fact check uh, with someone who's in prison? Like that's a challenge, um, but we, you know, made those things happen. Um, it was uh, the, the, the research behind the book um, was, was fairly intense, I must, I must say. Uh, a different kind of research than I've done in the past in my other books, but intense. Well, it weaves in really well with the narratives that you present. So I did find it a very compelling read, even though it is a heavy topic. And as you mentioned, it gave there were some things that gave you hope, and I found it hopeful as well. And um, between some of the programs and the people you've worked with, where do you where what gives you the most hope? What gives me the most hope are people who are risking their lives, their livelihoods, um, their safety, you know, to help others in need. That, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I, you know, I think there are times when I, I get really frustrated um, with the world and I look around and then I look at what some of the people that I've read about in the book are doing um, and that gives me hope, you know. Um, I, Chris Gargas, who I just mentioned, um, you know, he, he runs this, uh, he runs a, um, a prayer dinner, a Bible study, and anyone can come. Um, and, and it's, you know, there's, you, you don't have to stay for the Bible study. If you don't want to, you can leave. Um, you know, there's no, and there's no judgment. Um, he is one of the most non-judgmental humans that I, I've ever met, you know? Um, and I find it hard. I find, I find it hard. Um, I find it hard to, you know, like anybody, I find it hard to love people sometimes. I find it hard not to judge, right? And but I see people like him um, giving their lives to this work. And, uh, and that, that gives me hope. Um, I said earlier, I used the term scrappy and I kind of, I, I think I'm from South Carolina originally, born and raised in, uh, in Ohio, um, is, is, it has a different culture, it's a different place um, in South Carolina. Um, but one of the things I've always felt about Ohio is that there are a lot of people here who are really scrappy, you know? they they figure it out. Um, they, they work hard. They look for solutions. Um, they're not often the people in power, right? They're not often the people in power. And I think in this book, that's, that's pretty clear. But I think I like those stories. I think those stories are the ones that we need to be telling more of. I agree. They're very inspiring and uplifting. And I appreciate how much you give them credit for doing all this tremendous work without um, pay and without a lot of the resources that could really help them be more successful. Do you see that changing? I know um, you mentioned United Way at least down in Licking County being pretty active. Do you see funding going to these people eventually or? So there's a, about $30 million in the, uh, in the most recent COVID uh, bill to support harm reduction, which is huge. It's the first time that's happened. Um, it's a big step. Uh, that gives me hope. Um, but, but the question that I think people are, are raising is, you know, who's gonna get that money? Uh, how's it gonna be used? Um, is it gonna go to the, the large organizations? Is it gonna get to the community? Um, and I think that's like, that's one thing that I've learned to really appreciate from Trisha's work is that, you know, um, and I'm sure, you know, you've seen signs for like, you know, lock zone distribution or maybe church is having uh, a naloxone training or a library and that's good, it's important. People should carry it if they, if they think they're gonna be around people who use drugs. Um, but people who use drugs are actually the ones who are doing the most reverses, right? Reversals, like right? they're the ones who are saving a lot of lives. So you have to build relationships with people. You have to build, they have to trust you um, uh, enough and you and so you have to figure out how to get it to people where they're at right and sometimes that requires you know these community-based um, grassroots or organizers people like church right um, and and so we have to figure out how to support those people um, or, or someone like Eric who's in the early part of the book and Eric you know 
Eric does all this work, you know, no one pays him, but he goes and he connects people and he helps support people. And, you know, I, I would like to see, I would like to figure out ways to, um, to get funding in their hands. You know, I'd like, I'd like someone to pay Eric to do the thing that he does, right, um, to support him. Absolutely. I agree. It sounds like that um, would be hugely productive in this, in this fight, in this movement. And we're getting a little close to the end of our time. So I do just want to encourage everybody who might have any last minute thoughts or questions to please send those to us. Um, I will say that um, one of the things that we worked with you on, um, you provided a great discussion guide for this book and um, you've allowed us to make that available. That's on our website at buckeyebookfair.org. And the questions on there are really wonderful for um, personal reflection or for conversational reflection. And you know, I know when I read this and I think you've mentioned your own journey is really one of enlightenment through reading this and looking at the problem and people suffering from addiction through a new light. And um, do you have advice for people who are um, new to awareness about addiction and, and this growth and, and maybe even using your discussion guide as a great way to start some of those discussions and really open up um, the conversation? Um, I mean, I think there, there are a lot of really awesome organizations out there that are, that are, that are doing this work and have been doing this work for a while. Um, Drug Policy Alliance is an organization that I think um, is advocating around this issue. I think if you are seeking treatment or looking to support someone through treatment, um, findtreatment.gov is good. In Ohio, relink.org is useful. Um, but I would say uh, to, you know, you know, if, if you are interested to, to do the research, um, to start learning, learning about um, the ways in which we privilege certain kinds of, uh, you know, what we call treatment, we call, you know, 12 step or abstinence only and, and, and thinking about these things on the spectrum. Everyone um, who suffers from substance use disorder, um, you know, the reasons for, for having an addiction are there are many reasons why people have addictions, right? Um, but in general, the contemporary thinking on it is that it is a kind of learned behavior, right? But the reasons why that's happening are, you know, for many, many different reasons, right? And, and everyone's uh, addiction is different. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind and that it's complicated. Um, people uh, will um, have a quote unquote relapse, you know, you know, eight, nine times before they actually recover, but people do recover. I think that's something that we don't, we don't tell that story enough. And I try to tell that in this book, people do recover, people get better. Um, it's a health issue, right? Um, people who are having a mental health crisis recover, right? That happens. Um, and I, and so it's not, it's not hopeless. And, you know, um, the, th the most important thing, especially for opioid use disorders to keep in mind that love um, and actually medicine can help people who have uh, a guru use disorder. We know a lot about it, right? We know a lot about it. Um, so I do, I do, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I would never, and the, the other thing I would say too is I, I don't mean to, um, you know, be disrespectful of 12 step or, or, um, or, you know, because I know that it actually does work for, for a small percentage of people, but it also creates a support network for a lot of people. And I think that's important. Um, I know people who have found recovery um, through medication assisted treatment, but continue to uh, attend um, a 12 step group because it provides them a support network. And so that's important to keep in mind, you know, what is it that we're missing in this world, right? Maybe we're missing communication and community and connection. Um, and that's a big part of it. Um, and, and for a lot of folks, uh, you know, groups like that provide that for them. And that's important. It really is. Well, I, I thank you so much for the work that you've done on this topic and the book that you've written to share uh, these stories and this information. I found it really enlightening. 
and I, I don't see that I have any more questions at the moment. So I will uh, then say, say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you all so much for participating in tonight's program. We want to thank our presenter, Jack Schuler for really shining a light on this topic and giving us so much to think about. We'd also like to thank our generous sponsor, Ohio Humanities. Ohio Humanities is a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities and any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. In the chat are links where you can buy a copy of This is Ohio. It's a great book and I think you will all enjoy it and learn a lot from it. We hope you will join us for our next Ohio Book Talks discussion, where we are featuring Ohio authors discussing different parts of Ohio history. You can find more information and how to register on our website at buckeyebookfair.org. Please sign up for our newsletter as well as Ohio Humanities to stay informed about heritage programs like this. So thank you everybody and have a good evening.